Okay. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen. It's a beautiful Thursday here. The episode 115 brought to you by Tim's Snapchat. Tim Welch MT. Give him a follow. He's getting goofy on there every day. And patreon.com slash Red Hawk Academy for our ultimate supporters and our day one listeners. There's years of content up there. And other than that, then I mean I don't even know. I don't even know anymore. Uh, we can have mindset Mike right there. Oh I want Jakar right here. Oh yeah, yeah, no worries, Jakar. We got Jakar close coming in today. Talk about the slam heard around the world. He bounced that white boy's head off the canvas, put his lights out, and then uh, and we got Mindset Mike coming in. He, he's been on before. He talks about sports psychology and stuff everyone needs to know. So loosen up, get that posture up. Let's get started here. Love y'all. Here we go. Have yourself a refreshment of your choice. Have a slurp, and then we'll get started here. Okay, good. Here we go. Well, just got I just left the doctor's office, and um, supposedly this doctor, Dr. Mitchell, he's really conservative, so he likes people to go in a splint for two weeks and then put on a cast for two weeks and then go to the boot after that, but... My physical therapist, Al, talked him into letting me go into my boot. It's been two weeks today since I tore my Achilles or since I got surgery, and now I'm in a boot. So he just was a little nervous about it because some people take off their boot. They start fucking around. They slip, and they put that foot down again. They re-tear it. So that's what he doesn't want me to do. But I got this boot now, and this thing is much more comfortable and now I'll be able to sleep a little bit better because I can take this boot off, put this other little sleeve thing on there. But uh, yeah, I'm glad I didn't have to go into cast. This fucking this cast, it's like, God. Now I'll be able to start my therapy up a little bit sooner. And then I was talking to this coach from uh, Tennessee. He's this head coach of the strength conditioning down there. And um, he was talking, he's like, right now I should start my toe yoga every day. So I'll be doing that. Smoke a little of the Bud Bud and sit down and do toe yoga every day. And now I got Mariah here cooking me up a bag of smoke so we can let loose here. Because they, she was going to try to put me in this cast. This lady's going to try to put me in the cast and stretch my Achilles. Uh, and then supposedly I was going to be able to walk around that cast, which I don't know. I, I mean, I, I feel like I didn't get, really get good, clear information. So I'm going to be careful. I'm going to do some research myself. and uh, And we'll get going here. So I think I'll go into Vegas. I'm going to Vegas tomorrow. We got to leave at like 4 a.m. because I have some students. They're first up. Male blue belts are first up. And Mindset, it. Mike. That's it, Mike. Hey, Mike. How's it going, brother? I forgot what I was talking about here. What's that? Oh, yeah. We're going to Vegas. We're going to Vegas Thursday. So I got the, the blue belts competing there. I think I got five blue belts competing tomorrow. And then Friday, I don't have anyone competing. And then Saturday, I have a couple more people competing. So it'll be good. Mariah and I are going to cruise out there. We're going to drive the Tesla. So hopefully that puppy doesn't run out of miles. And then uh, just have, a, have that. And then next weekend, we're going, I think on Thursday, possibly, we're going to go to Karate Combat, watch Benson fight uh, Anthony Pettis, and then um, the press conference. I don't know if they announced that, but it's going to be a big press conference. And, uh, I mean, Cheeto Shug, they'll be Strickland on there, I'm sure. Ilya Tapuria, I'm sure. So it'll be a sweet press conference. Hopefully we get some good bickering going back and forth. And then Saturday we're doing a watch party at Zook Resort. And then uh, and then that's about it there. So what I've been watching, I've been watching The Golden Bachelor. The Golden Bachelor, and it's these older folks, 70s. 70s there's a few in the 80s and their partners have either died or they've had divorces some multiple divorces and 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 they're trying they're looking for love they're looking for love on that bachelor and it's funny to see because all the old old gals old gals roll up in the limo and they're trying to riz up the guy and the guy's trying to riz and that older age riz is that is just pure that is pure riz there 
Thank you for that, babe. That's actually some of the purest riz you'll see on that Golden Bachelor show. And they kiss. They suck face. They uh, And some of those old gals. Some of them old gals are hot. So a couple of the some of the ones he sent home early on were hot. I was like, whoa. I'd love to take her for a spin. So, what else? Uh, no, nothing really much. Nothing really much. It's kind of a pain in the ass to teach with this foot because I can't show moves. But I usually grab a couple of the purple belts before class and uh, explain to them what I want to do. And it's been going pretty good. It's going pretty good here at the Red Hawk Academy. And uh, welcome visitors. I mean, we're always welcoming visitors. People come in all the time. They're fans of the pod and stuff. But it's a pretty cool little joint here we got. Pretty cool. Hey, brother. What's up? Come on in. Uh, Mike, you can pop a squat in that one for today. Uh, right around the corner to the left there. Hi, Avery. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, we got a pretty cool little place going on. In the coffee shop, it's going good. And we're training some baristas here. We're training some baristas. We probably have got about four or five that Mariah's currently training to make the most ultimate latte. And it's been a good little hangout area, that place. That's exactly what I wanted because after uh, the classes in the main gym, I don't really want people sitting around chatting because as soon as people are chatting and a coach is teaching, it's so hard for that coach to just teach and keep their train of thought. It's hard enough to teach a group of 40 people, but when you have people chattering in the background, so I want them hanging out in the coffee shop and that's what it's been doing and it's just been, uh, it's been uh, really good. So we got my brother uh, Mindset Mike here in town. What are you doing in town, Mikey? My sister's getting married. Really? Yeah. It's her wedding rehearsal tonight, and then tomorrow she gets married. And we're from New York, so in very much New York style for any of the New York fans that are here, uh, she it's catered not by like a restaurant or anything. It's catered by New York, a genuine New York pizza food truck and uh, Carvel ice cream. I'm sorry, not Carvel. Mr. Softy Soft Serve Ice Cream from New York. And then let's hear your honest thoughts on this little husband that she's about to marry. Honestly, great dude. Is like, he? Like, yeah, five stars, totally approve. Like, I like, I enjoy hanging out with him. Mm -hmm. I ask for him to be my secret Santa every year. Like, I, I want to get stuff for him. He's a he's a good man. I feel very, uh, very glad. He's grown up a lot in the last couple of years. Not that he was ever in a bad place, but like, I'm very, very happy with who my sister's with. That's nice. How also, long, a major how, MMA fan, by the how way. How long they've been dating? Wow, a couple years now. I think that's what it takes. I mean, you see this. I'm watching The Golden Bachelor right now, and these girls these girls are acting so in love with this guy, and I think part of it, obviously, is because of the competition, but they have two or three interactions with them, and they're just like, I am so deeply in love with you. I'm like, God. And these are older folks. The yeah. Golden Bachelor is 70s. Oh, I didn't year know old. that. 70-year-old, <laughs> 6-year-old, 80-year-old, so pretty wise people. But uh, it's pretty pretty entertaining. Yeah, when, when people say they've they've known each other for a couple months and they're getting married, I just I'm just like, you're probably not the smartest dude. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's marriages that have worked out and they're just as successful that have met each other for a couple months. But it's like, how long did you date your wife before you married her? Well, so I'm not married. Okay, I'm not married. Um, but the what I feel like I've deep dived into a lot of like relationship psychology in the last two years for numerous reasons. People c confuse like connection and infatuation with compatibility and like the amount of work that I've done in my life over the years and then being a mindset coach as well, but like the amount of deep work that I've done, it is just not possible for human beings unless they get lucky to really have a sustainable, long-term healthy relationship unless you've done work, I've done work and we do work together. Mm -hmm. It's the amount of, that I've found it's fascinating. Um, that's why I think the divorce rate, 60%. We're chasing the wrong things. We're chasing things. We chase, we confuse connection with compatibility. And we also don't do the work. And ultimately your trauma or my, our, or my trauma will cause issues that will lead us to fall apart. Yeah. And then some couples just like, I mean, you got to be willing to compromise on some things. Mm. They're, they're programming so much different than yours. Um, their reaction to things, the way they were raised in certain areas are so much different. But if you can look at it from the outside and compromise a little right. bit and be wanting to compromise, a lot of couples, they don't want to compromise. So then it's like, it's just not going to work, right? Think of like, we go through school, we learn photosynthesis, chemistry, biology, all these things. You know what we don't learn? Emotional intelligence, self-regulation, emotional control, um, conflict management, like the things that actually, how did your taxes? 
like the things that actually matter in life. So we go into these relationships thinking that like life will prepare you for this. No, it won't. It's it like relationships is successful relationship and what it takes. Those are skills and you can have some natural gifts, but without just like real training and how to communicate, understand what it means for a woman to feel safe, seen and heard on vice versa, what a man needs. Like there's just so much more out there. It's fascinating. Yeah. It, it really is. I mean, and, and just like you said, you don't learn it in school. So the only people you learn it from is your parents' relationship and how your your dad's treating your mom or how Correct. she's and how much are they loving on each other and how much you see that true love. I think a lot of couples stay together because they think it's better for their child and then the child mm -hmm. seeing them not love on each other and just be right. snippy at each other. And then and that's the way their relationship is when they grow up. You know what's interesting about this topic or any other ones? The more that you dig, the more you realize you don't know. With anything. With anything. I mean, like, yeah, that's why it's like, even with relationship coaches, I'm like, they probably give a lot of good tools, and there's probably really bad ones and really good ones mm -hmm. too, but it would be hard to be a relationship coach because what do you do? Like, do you, you want this client to come back because obviously you need to make money, but then... I wonder if in a lot of the times does a relationship coach tell you, say, hey, you're in the wrong to the guy or the lady. Like, you're kind of in the wrong here. And this is what you need to do to fix it if you want to fix it. I wonder if they do that or if they always kind of stay in the middle. So my sister's a therapist. So obviously, like, what I do is 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 in my blood, kind of. And I feel like the, the cookie-cutter relationship coaches are therapists. Um, they're there to keep you on the books. They need to keep you on the books. Uh, there's a lady that I've paid upwards of $500 an hour. And her goal is to, like, I want you to see me as as the least amount as possible. Like I take care of you, you're good. You know, when you charge that amount, you can do that too, mm -hmm. right? But I think that's what it should be, but it's not what it is. There's a there's a guy in the jiu-jitsu community. So one of the one of the women at 10th Planet Austin, uh, her name's Whitney. I don't remember her last name, but she's, you know, friends with all those, like that core group of 10th Planet Austin girls. Whitney's married to a guy, I don't know his name, but his Instagram is the sovereign man. It was blonde Whitney that was dating Aubrey. I don't remember who Aubrey was. Well, Aubrey Marcus? Uh, it could have been. Okay. It, 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 it could not have been. with them, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure, but she's been married for a while. Oh. Um, I didn't know she was married, but she's married to a guy who's like a man's relationship type coach. And I think his perspective is fascinating. The Sovereign Man. I would definitely recommend you check out his content. Damn. Really see, good. That's the kind of, I want to have some of those like relationship type coaches on the pod here and just discuss, discuss, especially with this day and age. I mean, Human but, dynamic, that's all it is. It's what I deal with too, just with athletes. Yeah. They deal with it in a much deeper, like trauma-related way. It's to me, it's fascinating. Oh, I, I bet. Yeah, to, to me too. Especially now, nowadays and age, when you got this social media and it's so easily within a day or two to start building a relationship on mm -hmm. an app, Instagram, Snapchat. As soon as your partner's not doing what you want them to do, you're going to be sneaking around on there. And it's like, nowadays, it's probably 10 times harder as it was before before the apps it is it is i think we're just like anything else right this generation is the smartest of any other generation the most talented but the least resilient and possesses the most amount of barriers to success we were just thrown into the pool and our parents were like figure it out you know when i was in the fbi like the number one three words that i heard was figure it out you know now it's if if a kid can't go to google or siri for a problem they're frustrated if they can't connect to wi-fi what do they do you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. It definitely presents a lot of challenges. I don't think in real, I don't think social media has helped relationships much. I think it's given access to free therapy. Like I think you consume a lot of content, but Instagram also will put out what you want to hear, which honestly isn't always the best stuff. You only hear like one side of a story. So if you can be an unbiased person, Instagram's a great place to consume content about anything. As long as you see both sides of the yeah. spectrum. Yeah, I mean, just telling people what they need to hear be, besides the truth. I think I think it's so important, and obviously you know too, is like how important it is for a coach to be able to be honest with their with their guy. 100%. And even for me, it's like, okay, now Sugar's the best fighter in the world right now at 135 pounds. He's the UFC champion. So even still, it'd be easy to turn into this like, yes, 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 yes. But still, you got to tell him kind of what they want to hear, even if he, he kind of steps back. You know, it's hard, but it's important that a coach does that. Do you agree? I agree 100%. So Dabo Swinney, the head coach of Clemson football, uh, the guy that had Alabama's number for many years, he he talks about how like they don't care what you know until they know that you care. 
people talk about he, he always talks about how important faith is and you know god this god that and that's and that's and that's great for them that's a big part of their culture people were criticizing him as like how can you be such a devout christian but scream at your players he's like whoa 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 he's like you you're misunderstanding he's like i'm not calling them out i'm calling them up right? Like they know I love them. So if I give them harsh feedback, they know I love them first. I don't treat them like a commodity. They're not a player. They're a young man that plays football for me. Like, but they're not a football player. They're a young man first. And that's what I've realized that when a coach and an athlete can build a connection that's outside where like the athlete genuinely feels like you care beyond just that, they could take difficult conversations. Let's dial that back to the, to the team dynamic. Most people on a team, oh man, I love you, man. You're the best. Like, do you like? Do you really? Oh, yeah, we're we're a big family. Are you like if if your teammate called you at two a.m. Are you are you coming to pick them up and they're in trouble? Or are you going to screen their call and like text them in the morning if they're okay? Because if your sister called you, if my sister called me at two a.m. and she said I need you, I'm I'm in a car heading there. Mm -hmm. So the 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 moral of that story is when a coach and an athlete can build a connection that's bigger than sports, and the teammates can build connection bigger than sports. What that gives is trust. What that gives is they'll fight harder for each other and for you. And what that gives is the ability to have hard conversations. And you they'll feel like you're calling them up to their potential, not calling them out on what they're doing wrong. Um, that also requires the other person to be have emotional intelligence and you know some skills that aren't always standard. But I think it's incredibly important, exactly what you said. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. It's total sense too. If 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 you're getting harsh, I mean, you think it's almost like a dig at you, a dig at your skills, a dig at your mental toughness or something. But you know that person truly actually cares for you and what's wants what's best. Then you'll probably sit back and listen to it. I think that is huge. It's like, like when our parents call us out. Like we don't like it, especially when we're younger. We don't like it. But like as an adult, if your parents say something to you and you don't like it, you know that they're only coming from a good place mm -hmm. or someone you really care about or respect. If you if you care about them, they care about you, you respect them, they respect you, and they come at you with some sort of like what feels like critical advice, you probably take it more so like feedback and not criticism. So you take it for what it's worth, but you know it's coming from a good place. That's where a lot of people struggle and that's where I think MMA coaches, like I think you are naturally good at some of the things that you do, you, you do. And then you've read a million books, met a million people, thought a million things where, you know, you've evolved into what you've become, right? Most people are not naturally good at these things. Like think of the, just the sport in general. They're not, people that punch each other in the face for a living aren't exactly the most, <laughs> the, the, typically the people that have the strongest amount of like emotional control and ability to take and receive feedback. Mm -hmm. So I think, like you and Sugar's relationship, I think is super cool and unique because that was organic from day one. I don't think that there was like a strategy for you for how to develop this part friendship, part coaching, part business. Like you dipped in all the pools. Like think about being in a relationship. I mean, you're, you're with your wife, you're in business with your wife and you also train your wife. Like you're wearing three hats that most people can't get one right. So like, I was thinking on the way here, two things like, you know, one, just how impressive that like whole journey you guys had together was like, it's so cool. I texted you the day after, I don't know if you remember, texted you the day after the fight. And like, I've been in your shoes, not in a, well, I mean, I've been there at a USC title fight, but like not in the same sense where something that I worked with an athlete that I believed in before they were ever what they were. From the beginning, like I see something in you, you're special. I'm gonna invest in you. Like I'm gonna spend a lot of time with you. Like that moment of you putting your hands up, like crying, like I've been there. Like I knew what that felt like. I was so happy for you. Like I guess next to like a birth of a child, I cannot imagine like another moment that feels so good than you felt like in that moment. Yeah, I mean, I know when I once I sit back and think about it too, where we did come from, get into that moment. He was shaving his eyebrows for money. 50 bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and now he did things like similar come up to Conor McGregor where no one really took him seriously for a while. Mm -hmm. And then he kept getting results. And then he, he did something that he wasn't supposed to do that day. And he did it in like meticulous fashion. And I, I don't know. I was just, I was super happy for you. And like, I've been on a similar, been on similar journeys where like, that's, that's the most fulfilling thing. Like just few things so much more fulfilling than that moment when you guys hugged each other, seeing like, yo, we, and you said this to him, we did it. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's fucking crazy right now. I mean, thinking back on it, it's just like, it's like 
feels like a movie a little bit. But freaking sweet. Freaking sweet. And now we got a tough test ahead of us here with uh, Cheeto. Completely different style. I, I've been seeing some videos and stuff. I think Cheeto's going to try to wrestle him. But I think Cheeto will shortly realize that the distance and the way he switched directions, is so, it's so hard to wrestle someone. I mean, anyone, any, any wrestler knows if someone's backing up the whole, I mean, backing up and going side to side, it's hard to take them down. To yeah. penetrate on a good shot, you need them coming forward. Um, like, it's tough. So I think Cheeto might abandon that early on. And then Cheeto's durable. He's got strong shins, and he's going to try to kick Sean's arms, and he's going to try to ki- batter his legs. That's going to be his plan, and I think it's going to be a tough fight because Cheeto's never been finished. Um, so we got a, a tough challenge ahead. But I'm pumped for it. It should be sweet. Main event in Miami, it should be like another movie, hopefully. Yeah, I think it will be. I think that's a great fight. They were both, while they were on their come up when they fought, they're both completely different fighters now, just like so much more evolved. You know, like not not that the talent is that much different, but they're just so much farther in each of their careers. And, uh, you know, I'm curious, like ultimately as a competitor, you want like, I want the best version of you to show up. I want the best version of me to show up. Like, I'm curious what that looks like. It's going to be a good yeah. matchup. Yeah, and we wouldn't be mad if the worst version of Cheeto showed up. <laughs> Just believe there was a lot of cheddar. <laughs> we would not. We would not. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and the thing is too, like Cheeto's confidence is probably pretty high, but right now Sugar's confidence is high. Like he knows he can touch people in the right spot, and the lights will shut off. And now he knows he had the best grappler in the division deep in on a double leg on him against the cage and we didn't work any wrestling went over it mentally a lot um because he was hurt right yeah hurt the whole time so we, we were trying not to aggravate the the rib at all so we were trying to do zero grappling but he he knows he's smart we, he knows what to do on the fence we worked a lot on the fence on how to defend those single legs spreading your legs and having a good re- reaction right off the rip and he had great reactions in the first round, when Aljo had him against the fence, he had the wrist and a collar tie. And in the second round, when he fell over and Aljo shot into a double, he ended up escaping those, and those were the those changed the fight. I I, I do want to make a comment about that. So, people, this is in relation to confidence. People, or you know, a harp on confidence is so important. I agree, it's important. I have a hot take. You don't need confidence to be successful. Confidence just makes it easier. If I wanted to burn this room down, I would light something on fire. It'll burn eventually. Now, if I throw a gallon of gasoline, it'll burn very quickly, very efficiently. So on the flip side, what I feel like is confidence is that gasoline where you don't need confidence to be successful. And I'm talking, let's say the average typical person, they feel like they have to beat a certain person or win a certain thing or do a certain thing, and then they will believe in themselves. So this this idea that I need to be confident, it, it prohibits the top, the, the bottom 90%, I feel like, from being successful because they're waiting to prove themselves versus like, you know who Alex Hormazi is, right? The guy on Instagram? Yes. Love him. Him and Chris Williamson will say, you know, you don't gain confidence by shouting affirmations in the mirror. You have it by having an undeniable stack of proof that you are who the fuck you say you are. So even if you haven't done X at all, you, you haven't proved that. If you can give yourself enough data Like you have enough proof that like, I can do it. Like I'm capable. Here's some examples of why I am capable. Or maybe you have done X, Y, and Z, right? So I I just wanted to point out that like confidence is a weapon to people that have it, but you don't need it to be successful in Mm. my opinion. Yeah, that that is super interesting. Makes it a lot easier. It's gasoline on the fire. Yeah, I mean, now it's like when, when you knock out that many people, you knock them out cold and you know every single fight you hurt someone and wobble your knees any striking coach is going to know like damn that is very very dangerous when he hits that hard his speed is that good his eyes are that good and he believes in his shots that much that's a scary thing and uh and, and he can defend the wrestling now yes like showing that he could defend wrestling against someone like aljo like i think that proves a lot so confidence for him will be an edge i think the I'm not concerned with this for sugar at all. Like just the brief time I've gotten to know both of you and seeing you off camera and understanding you off camera. I think like uh, where people would struggle, not in his shoes is balancing, like still being humble, like having humility, humbleness, trying to get better every day and knowing that like I've done all these things. I think people get too high on themselves and you shouldn't get high on yourself or low on criticism. So just his personality off the camera strikes me as someone that's like, oh, he's trying to get better pretty humble despite his like very boisterous personality mm-hmm. so 
I think that's the only place where people in his shoes would struggle, but I don't necessarily see him struggling with that. Yeah, I think it helps that we have just such good training partners too. It's like you think you're tough, okay? Let's let's come here on a competition training day and try to tap these guys out, and you just get smoked, and you're like, <laughs> oh fuck, yeah. I got a lot of fucking work to do. Yeah. Uh, but we have a bunch of Patreon questions here. We'll go over one. This is from uh, Joseph Griffin. This is for uh, Coach Mike. Oh, yeah. By the way, I think, are you, are you going to Italy also? I am. So she approached me and she was she was talking about a competitive. So uh, Rose Athena, who runs uh, Base Fight Camp, she was doing a, a five-day grappling and MMA seminar in Italy. She approached me uh she wants the theme to be like a competition mindset type camp. And she was looking for people um, who would also fit in the MMA world. And I'm the one that gave your name. Sweet. So, so I was like, I think, I think Tim, cause Tim's also obviously a very good black belt. So this is jujitsu, but she also brings in MMA people. You know, I was like, this is someone who's having success right now. Who's also like obsessive about the mental performance piece. So I think Tim would be a good fit. Hit him up, so I'll see you in Rome, dude. Sweet. So June, June, we're going to uh, Italy here for yeah. for a four. I think it's a four day, like, five days, five day camp, four training, one one day where we just have fun in the middle. Dang. So the the, the people are gonna like that. That'll be cool. Yeah, be cool to uh, eat some. I don't know. Italy's just gonna be cool. I've never even. Have you never been? Never been. Never even seen a video. Excited about it to spin it with you. Yeah. Excited to experience it with you. It's gonna be great. Yeah, it's gonna be sweet. So here's Joe Griffin. This one's for uh, Coach Mike here. Uh, what are the top three or most important habits to build slash maintain develop slash maintain to develop mental toughness outside of just training? What are some good methods to keep a positive perspective mindset leading up to the fight? Great question. So I think you asked two separate things. You talk yeah. about mental toughness and then you talk about like positive perspective. Um, there's three layers to building an athlete. So if you guys look at me, it's three. It's the bottom layer is physical. The middle layer is psychological. Think of it like a triangle. Physical, psychological, and then heart. Everybody tries to physically outwork their psychological shortcomings, like strength, speed, skill. They try to work hard to overcome confidence issues. But that's not how it works. You don't get better at math studying English, right? So if you com your confidence will overcome your lack of speed, strength, or skill. Your heart, courage, empathy, gratitude, things like that, that overcomes all other two dimensions. If you're struggling with confidence... Being thankful for the opportunity, excited to compete will overcome the lack of confidence. You are way more excited to compete than you care about winning and losing. So confidence is no longer a factor. You're excited to be there. That's my, that's my preface to the answer. My answer to you to keep a positive perspective is like, I won't necessarily say top three tips. I'll just speak. I think the number one thing that you have to do is become obsessed with self-improvement. Get lost in the sauce of getting better. Not worrying about like... Like you're not trying to prepare to win a fight. You're trying to get as good as you can get in six to eight weeks, but measurably data driven, meaning that like you need some sort of strategic journaling that is harped around strategic questions where you're measuring yourself with intention and assessment every day. Part of that journaling has to go around strategic gratitude building. Like if you look at Penn State, who's won 10 out of 12 national titles, they're 49 and five in the semifinals of the national tournament. They not only talk about gratitude, they practice it daily. They recruit in a culture that is based around that. That is why when in the biggest of matches, NCAA semifinals, they are the most free, the most excited, and score the most points. They bonus point people in these big matches because they're more excited to compete than they care about winning and losing. So gratitude and stress do not coexist in the brain. They're oil and water. So the more gratitude that you have, the less stress that will exist. So if you can build up a dopamine bank account full of gratitude, then you don't even have room for the stress. If I got a cup of water and 80% of it is filled up, I only got 20% to put anything else in it. So systematically building gratitude through the process of self-improvement, that's the easiest thing. The other thing is you being really intentional. Fighters, I remember Eric Nixick talking about this. People don't watch film. People don't game plan. They have ideas of what they want to do, but they don't game plan like, I'm sure the top coaches do. They don't game plan in that way. Um, so I think being really intentional in your training. So that's not the cookie cutter, feel good, typical kind of conversation where like, you know, building toughness and shit. No, be intentional, build gratitude, be really assessment oriented, like take data. Like whoever that is, if you want to DM me on Instagram, like 
I'll send you some of the questions that you should ask yourself if you're a fighter. I'm not going to share it with the world because mm -hmm. it's my secret sauce, but I'll share a couple and it'll give you an idea. Become obsessed with getting better, intentionally build gratitude and um, understand like your strengths, weaknesses and opportunities and threats in the fight. Where am I good? Where am I weak? Where am I better than him? Where is he better than me? Mm -hmm. People don't think like that. Yeah. Yeah. So even even Drakkar here, he was uh, he was out. What's for, up, brother? What up, brother? This How was you out, he were out for two years, right, Dre? The first time, just before this last ACL, yeah, before two this years. last fight, ACL brothers. Yeah, I got one too. <laughs> yeah, so eight. I mean, two years you've been out. You were on a two fight win streak already, but two years you've been out, and it seems like you came back. Sometimes you you're a 155 pounder, and I've seen you about 205 pounds before. <laughs> yeah, I get up there. Mm -hmm. Tits swaying. Fight, jiggling all over the place <laughs> but uh but it seemed like this fight camp it just seemed like everything was just so dialed and it was a, probably had a lot to do with coach joe and just your experience and uh why were you so dialed this fight because you started fight camp at uh, what 179 pounds which is like yeah that's before you've never done that uh you know i gotta give a lot of that to joe and a lot to you guys you and suge you know what i mean like you taught suge at a younger age you know, and now I'm just now picking up the shit that you guys are doing. And now it's like, if I stay healthy all year round, I don't have to get ready. Mm -hmm. And then every time I'm trying to get ready, that's when I get hurt because I'm carrying all that extra weight. Mm -hmm. so, tra so train like a champion, be a champion. Live like one. Live like one. Yeah. And that's hard. I mean, that's hard for, I mean, college wrestlers coming up and, and, and when you're new to fighting and when you're 20, 21, 22, 23, you can still eat fucking cheeseburgers and a, a pound of Skittles and head into practice and uh, get through it. But it seems like when you get older and stuff, all that bad food literally adds inflammation to your joints and you're not recovering at all. Training twice a day, going to bed inflamed, waking up inflamed, and then boom, you get hurt. I agree with you. I think here's the thing. No one teaches you fighters. Like, like just like we were talking, no one teaches emotional intelligence in school and they should. No one teaches you like the right way to cut weight, manage your lifestyle. Like maybe you wrestled before and you have an idea, but wrestlers even had toxic habits when we were in college. Like what I know now, I wish I knew then. You know, and, and if, if, if everybody to become a fighter required a certification course where you had to be a minute, like to get a professional fight, you need a blue belt. You need to have done this many jujitsu tournaments. You need to have a blue belt level understanding in nutrition. Like you have to, for USA wrestling to be a coach, you have to like certify and learn things. If every fighter just had basic understanding of some of these things, they would understand. But like people just don't know what they don't know. So at the high level, people do it and they hire nutritionists to do all these things. But like, ultimately, like, like we said, it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. You don't have to be ready like Chad Mendez was back in the day where you're just always ready to take a short notice fight. But you gotta be, it's not in camp, out of camp weight mm. where you fluctuate 30, 40 pounds or eat whatever you want to like, okay, for the next eight weeks, I'm gonna be good. But fighters don't know that. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how many people just don't understand what it takes to live that life. It kind of sucks because I know I've developed an eating disorder. You know All of I mean? us, like yeah, like I'll do I'll do so good, and then right out of camp, binge binge eat so much, and then it's like back to back to back every camp. Yeah, it's like well, especially big big guys like you. You're 190 pounds. Okay, you sign a contract. You have to fight in eight weeks. So now you have to be so strict, being freaking like deficient on calories. You have to eat barely any calories grind through this training and it's just miserable so then when that once that day's over it's like every single meal you know that's going to come again that's going that eight weeks is going to come again so every meal until it's there you're just fucking housing it so you know i was lucky after this fight i was like i'm only going to have one cheat meal and that was just two in and out burgers and then you smoked a little of the buddha though oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i was like i'm not gonna smoke and then you got me the christmas present the volcano you like it and then Pop Buddha gave me some weed. I'm like, oh <laughs> god damn it, <laughs> dude! I think I think that weed can be good for you if you if you, if you can do good shit for yourself when you're high, even if it's read a little bit, even if it's go under the red light, even if it's go out in the sun and just, I think it can be good for you. But if you always just plop on the couch and just eat, then it's like, well, it's probably shitty for you. Yeah. Then. Yeah, the volcano doesn't make me feel that way. It makes me want to go do out some and do shit? shit. Yeah. Yeah, there's something about those big bong rips and all that smoke and all that just burnt shit going into your lungs. But then this volcano, it's this clean vapor. And I think you actually actually get the benefits from the the herbs. 
But uh, so the fight week was good. You had a uh, bulldog out there, Alex out there, and uh, the coach Crouch out, out there at the end of the week was yep. just a good week overall. Yeah, it was a it was a great week. You know, that was probably the most energy I've had all week. You know, I, most time I just train once a day, and that's just at night. But this time we would get up in the morning, uh, go through our little routine, work out, and then work out again at night. And most time I'm like, fuck, I don't want to be touched. I, I was I was able to wrestle, do everything um, that I was able to do in camp. So it was just way perfect. And then on the walkout and stuff, it just seemed like you were just pretty comfortable. I mean, you had you had a pretty healthy fight camp, and uh, you're fighting a tough guy who's really good on the ground. And then we were, I mean, the whole time it's like, you're, the kid's not taking you down. He can't take you down. Ten seconds into the fight, he <laughs> takes you down. But then, real, but you stayed so calm about it too, and you did such a good game plan. Old Jakar would belly out, give up his back right away. The guy'd be, he'd be fighting off a body triangle, uh, but you stayed calm, worked your half guard, and found found the right time to scramble and get on top. Yeah. What yeah. was going through your mind right when you took you down, like this motherfucker? Dude, like at Wayne's, I was like, when I put my fist in his face, I'm like, hey, fucking fight me, don't wrestle. He was like, okay. So in my head, I'm thinking like, yeah, hey, he's gonna scrap me up. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, motherfucker shot on me. Uh huh. <laughs> Scrambled him out. Dance with the girl that brought you here. That's yeah. what Ben Askren used to say. Dance with the girl that brought you. If you wrestle, wrestle. Yep. But I, I, obviously, to evolve, you need to do more. But I, I always think of that. Like it, it, It's rare to see what Bo Nickel did. You know, to like, I'm not going to wrestle. I'm going to throw hands. No, most wrestlers just yeah. try to wrestle. But it just sucks in this game. It's like, you got to put butts in a seat. People mm-hmm. aren't going to pay to just watch it. We could have did Naga on Sunday. You know what I mean? Agreed. Like, we didn't. We didn't. I didn't have to do all that. So yeah. No, I, I I agree with you. That's why I'm glad to see guys like Bo Nickel like trying to step outside the box and get comfortable throwing hands. Yeah. What do you mean you could have done Nog on Sunday? What do you mean about that? I mean, I'm, if you I'm, wanted to wrestle, if, yeah. If we went, wanted to wrestle, we went to yeah, yeah, we could have did that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's tough. Who's the most boring fighter that has a big name because they're good at talking? Ben Askren was one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was one because he would. Ben Askren was weird. A lot of his Bellator fights, he literally would just take the shittiest shot, like. And just end up on top. But that's how his wrestling in college was too. Yeah, was it? Yeah, yep. it was ugly. He was he was the king of the funk. He invented funk. He was the OG funk master. So all the funk stuff came from Ben and his brother. They were the innovators in that. No one did that. That's why no one touched him for however many years. You'd be like, "What are you doing? You're in terrible position." Holy shit! You're pinning the guy. Yeah. What happened? Fucking weird. It's like shit. when you should go left and he goes right. Like fuck. That does, that feels weird. Yeah. Yeah. So then a little later on in the fight, this kid, I mean, arm bars are dangerous in, in MMA because you have this glove. It's like a handle to keep your elbow inside your legs. But this kid slapped up an arm bar and I was like, fuck, that's deep. But then you got that big butt underneath you and you lifted him up. Right when you lifted him up, you were pretty much probably expecting to slam him and pull out. Oh, but yeah. you aimed him on his head. That was nice. I don't know how, like, he just tilted perfect for me. Wait, uh-huh. was that you that knocked the dude out on yeah. the arm bar? Yeah. That's sick. I watched that like 20 times. I had to realize that was you. That's sick. Yeah. Yeah. And then you bounced his head off the canvas. Literally. And, and that uh, knocked him out. Yeah. That was that, that was pretty sweet. That's because that's your. Because I'm trying to think of another finish. What's another finish you've had? Uh, Brandon Jenkins. Oh, yeah. But this was a sicker one. Yeah. This is your first kind of more viral moment, vi- huh? Yeah. Yeah. And then after, got on the mic and uh, gave his sponsors a, a thank you. And then said something good that I liked. I want to fight the easiest guys for the money. <laughs> I, I mean, it's like everyone wants to just be like, I want to fight the tough. So you want to fight the best motherfucker for the same pay. <laughs> for the same pay. Right. Or you want to fight a guy that there's a good, there's a way higher percentage chance that you're going to whoop his ass and you're going to get the second paycheck and then your pay is going to go up and up and up. For me, like for my next fight, it's either I want to fight Benil, something that's going to put me in the top 10, or I just want to fight the easiest guy. Yeah. I wonder if they'd redo that match. I think they might. That would be so sweet if you could rematch Benil. Dude. But I, someone said he was trying to retire in the cage. Well, fuck. Let me retire him. Mm-hmm. Fuck. Yeah. I, need, I, need to get that, I need to get that win back, dude. Get that highlight fucking fuck, back. Dude. How long did he last in that last fight? 
I think it was in the first round. I think it was like two minutes in. Yeah. That's yeah, tough. I mean, you did such a good job too at coming back because some people like when they after they get knocked out, they come back and it just demoralizes them. Yeah. There's just like some people never want to fight again, and especially a fight like that where you're seeing it on TV over and over and over, dude. All right, the fucking right, time. right before I was walking out, they fucking showed his highlight. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, bro, I'm on the fucking same card. Why y'all got a fucking God, show right damn. now? Damn, that's crazy. But the way you just battled it. Didn't even worry about it. Were you pretty? Were you pretty good this fight at just kind of just staying in the moment, being where your feet are? It looked like on the walkout you were enjoying the walkout and you're just all there. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like I, I always bring up Suge and you know, like every time I'm at the fights, like watching Mario, everyone, like just being in that moment. And you know, and I think Suge does a really got a good job. You know what I mean? He takes in all that fucking energy on that walkout, mm -hmm. and you know that's you know that's what I kind of wanted to do. Just Fuck be there, yeah. be there in that moment. Yeah, and you see some people too, especially now. He's Sean's really good at. I mean, we've learned from people in the past that just all you don't want to get too fucking amped up. Mm -hmm. You get too amped up in the locker room. You hit mitts too hard. You grapple too hard. Then you want to hit mitts more because you're nervous and you're anxious. So you want to grapple harder. Just like all fight day, we're saving every bit of that energy for that five rounds yeah, and for I that think, twenty five minutes. And I think we did a good job warming up this time because. When I fought Rafa, I think I warmed up way too long. And I kind of like burnt myself out before I even got to the fight. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? This time we just did 10 minutes and then just chill. You just got to spike your heart rate two or three times. Yeah. That's really it. Yeah. Can I can I say something about yeah. that energy? Okay, so something I found. So obviously, like with Northwestern winning NCAAs last year, uh, we took a lot of data. Every week we took data. And the number one data driving factor that led to a good or bad performance, win or loss, was uh, energy level. So like at the end of the games, they would pull the girls. Uh, what was your energy level? What would you rate the bench? Okay, so I'll ask you guys a question. When the team's energy was at a five or below, what was their win percentage? This is division one lacrosse, top team in the country. Five or below, what was the win rate? 60%. 25%. What was their win rate when their energy was at a seven or, uh, was at a seven or above? Probably 90. 100. Oh, 100%. So what that tells me, and we talked about this on Timbo and the Sugar Show, was like thoughts are just things. They're not good. They're not bad. They're not higher. They're low. Like feelings come and go. Thoughts come and go. The What you need to find is a neutral gear. And like two things. That, that Indian guy that was on Rogan turned me on to this combined with something that Kobe said. Kobe always talks about how he wants to be still. He's like, emotions come and go. Thoughts come and go. I want to be still. That, that, that other guy talked about how thoughts are just things or situations to respond to. I combine that into, that means we need to operate in a neutral gear. So if you were to think of the three best fights that you've ever fought, your energy level was whatever it was, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so at around an eight, eight and a half, that's no, when you perform. You're, and you're talking energy level when he's in the cage, right when he steps in. I'm saying like the entire time, like I know there's different parts Ultimately, like you want to walk into and stay in right around. Like if your ideal energy is a seven and a half, then you're not you're not going any any lower than a seven to an eight. So in your warm ups, you don't want to stay any longer in like a nine or a ten. You won't be at a five or a six. The point being is that wherever your optimal energy level, that is now your neutral gear. We want to fight in neutral. We don't want to have highs or lows. And if you feel like you're at a five, but you're supposed to be at a seven, you need to get yourself excited, bring yourself up to a seven. If you're at a twelve and you need to be at a seven, you need to get yourself down. And I only say that just because I've got data to back it up at this point and more than two teams with that data. So I think it's so important, like you said, that you save the energy. I relate it to treat your brain and your energy like a cell phone battery. And if you don't recharge it, you're not gonna have enough in the fight. So, and if you're doing too much or you're watching fights or you're getting excited, it's like streaming on your phone. The goal is like, you should be on airplane mode most of the day not worrying about much until you get there and do your thing. So again, things I think you guys do really well. I think you come in with a full tank. Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, I kind of made the mistake. We have a kid who's very explosive athlete, three-time state champion. He hits hard. Um, walking out to the cage, it was a second amateur fight. And a lot of this, I mean, everyone's going to be different when the way they want to come out and the way they're learning. But I feel like I had him a little too calm. I had him following him his breath. I had him a little bit too calm, and he went out there not really urgent with his body. Mm -hmm. Maybe his body was a little too calm. His mind was a little too calm, mm -hmm. and he got cracked right off the rip, and it changed the 
change the fight mm -hmm. compared to like, hey, let's fucking be ready to go. You can st still be calm in your mind, but your body's got to be urgent and ready to go. Come out and start getting that guy on his back foot right away. You got to know where your, your guys, each of them have a different neutral gear. Maybe you're a seven, maybe you're an eight, maybe I'm a six and a half. So like every guy's different. Like we, like, like we can't just read people and assume that like, I want this guy to be calm. This guy wants to be amped up. Like just take data. Think, think your three best fights. What was your overall energy level in that fight? Take the average. And that's where your neutral gear should be within a point. And then we keep them there. So if they're low, let's get them excited. If they're high, let's calm them down. Let's not be default calm or default excited. Some people will adrenaline dump. Other people won't be urgent. Yeah, that had a one fight. I'm like, Bruce Buffett calls my name. I'm like, fuck, dude. I'm not... Gassed. What the fuck am I doing here? No, oh, I'm really? just saying like, yeah. God damn, I'm I'm out to fight right now. Wake the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would love to see. I mean, a, a, t so many fighters that way. When Bruce is announcing, I'm just like, what's going through their mind? I could imagine. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I guess it just does take. Ex I mean, experience and taking the data, like, taking experience, and especially as an amateur. Like Jimmy, I thought we were doing the right thing a little yeah. bit, just because he's so explosive that he does get tired in the later rounds. So being calm early on, but. Now we know. Maybe next time, hey, let's be ready to fucking fight when that yeah. bell starts. Yeah, because Jimmy, dude, he he has what it takes. Yeah, you know what I mean, he's really aggressive. You can't you can't teach that. Mm -hmm. So, but so. like you said, it's just a learning, learning lesson. So, okay, next one here. No, but right after, I mean, right after, right when you slammed on his head, when did you when did you know like fuck yeah, I'm probably gonna get extra fifty G's. Fuck! As soon as I slammed him, as soon <laughs> yeah. as I slammed him, yeah. is that what went through your mind? Yeah, yeah. that's awesome, man. <laughs> that's sweet. I watched it probably twenty five times, yeah. bro. Was I was so fucking happy just because you deserve it. But You're I was just thinking, like, why the fuck did he hold on to my arm? Like it was, it was, wasn't close. Well, I think once you got him, when once you lifted him, you slipped your elbow out. I think initially it was right when he slapped it up. It was above your elbow. And he needs to start extending. And then you teach people. You teach people the wrong defense is to stand up. But when you're so fucking powerful and quick, like Rampage Jackson, fucking Dracar, he stood up real quick with all that power and fucking. And you didn't just lift him up and set him down. You like used your hips and bounced his head off. It almost canvas. looked like a mat return. You know when you kick yeah. a guy's leg out on a mat return, mm -hmm. like it looked like he went, he went vert. He went, yeah, it felt like just a, a kettlebell swing. Exactly. <laughs> Boom. So, his, his hips came out, which is why he yeah. slammed against the side of his head. Fuck. Lights off. Well, I'm glad he wrestled me. Yeah, it was beautiful. <laughs> so uh, uh, this one's Justin Lathy here. Congra congrats to Jakar as well. What's the chances of you being on Sean's card in March? Fuck, I hope 100%. That's what we're working for? Yeah, that's what we're working for. Um, well, when's the baby due? I know th I know. Courtney's a little, a little sad and mad about that. Cause she's like, oh, you might miss the baby's birth. And I'm like, you say daddy's got to make some, I got to make some money. Yeah. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, yeah, the baby, he, he'll, he'll be way more happier if I ha have money for him. So. Uh -huh. Baby will understand with an extra 50 G's. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That'd be so sick. If When's the baby card, do? bro? Uh, February 21st. Awesome. So hopefully he comes the yeah. 21st, then she won't, won't be mad. Yeah. You want to deal with it. But it's probably good too, especially you're healthy now. It's like, what else are you gonna do? I mean, it's not like you want to stay at a camp forever. Yep. It's like joy training. And it's like when when something's hot, you gotta you gotta roll with it. You know what I yeah. mean? Like yeah. this could lead to something great. Well, think about Kevin Holland in 2020, right? When he went when he went five and zero. Oh. Yep. Like if you're doing good, then like take it, take it, take it. But that's where that's where lifestyle comes in so important. Like you can't be out of shape and get in shape and take short notice fights. You have to you have to be ready to stay ready. You have to stay ready to be ready. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and right now Jakar's got a good opportunity to make a good little run for the title. Yep, which will be go. sweet. And then you know I think like again I have to get a lot lot of credit to you because you hired him hired me to coach here and that's kept me focused. Hell you know yeah, what I mean I can't go out and party and do all that stupid shit like I used to. Do you know why else that's important? It gave you purpose yep. because you're not just training here for yourself. Now you're coaching. So you have to do it for something bigger than you. Yep. So you show up, not just for you, you show up for them. Yep. So it yeah. gives you a different. And, and, I, and I, yeah. And I love coaching the guys, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like they're like my little kids, but yeah, even mm -hmm. though I don't like, it's like, fuck, I'm still training, but they're, they are like my little kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's nice. I mean, cause if I didn't have to come to the gym at night, what the fuck would I do? Sit at home, beat off again. Yep. I could come out, hang out with my boys, teach them how to whoop some ass, teach them how to choke each other, and it's just good times. It's fucking good times, so hell yeah.
Uh, this one's from Justin Leith Um, Does Mike find that a lot of athletes deal with anxiety? I mean, every athlete, right? Yeah, yeah, every athlete to some degree. I would say 90% of athletes are debilitated by it. The top 9%, it doesn't bother them, but it's distracting. Uh, the top 1% use fear as fuel. So I think, you know, everyone has varying levels, but once you get to the top, let's say the top 10%, most of them don't struggle, but they're distracted, right? Like they get all the thoughts, they get all the feelings and they're like, I'm fine, I'm fine. The top 1% take all those thoughts and feelings and use it as leverage. So we're talking about coming out for a walkout, right? And using the energy. So I'll give an example. When I worked with Patricky Pipple when he beat Peter Queeley, we're in Dublin for the first event after COVID. Um, that's Conor McGregor's best friend in his hometown. Like we understand his walkout song is going to be Sinead O'Connor for like 15 minutes. We understand that he's going to get booed real bad. Okay. So instead of, and, and he also just lost to Peter Creeley because of medical stoppage previously. So instead of worrying about like what that energy is going to do and like all the anxiety that it's going to be for like booze so loud. Like, I don't know if you've ever been to the 303 arena. It's nuts. Like Brazilian fans, Irish fans, the best and the worst of the crazy. The arena shook with how loud the booze the booze were because it's such an intimate place. So we're like, we're not going to let you listen to that. He put on headphones and listened to Portuguese music and danced the whole way down there. And then when he took his headphones off, what do we do? We we said, okay, listen, they're going to boo you a little bit. It's not personal. They just like Peter Queeley more than you. Um, when they play Irish music for 15 minutes, like that's your energy too. Soak it up. Like enjoy that. Like it, it's it's going to be a cool moment. I say that to say is that that's what a one percenter does. The one percenter takes those situations. Like I think Aljo struggled with the booze and when he fought Sugar. I yeah. think he did not like being well received. The same way Wei Lee the first time against Rose when she got booed didn't know how to receive that. So um, again, everyone struggles with it. The best just know how to deal with it. They learn process and skills. And that's what this Milt says here. He says, what have you seen in young athletes that sets them apart mentally from their counterparts? Just being a competitor, I mean. No, I think it's it goes back to what we said before. When I watch somebody compete, I see one of two types of people. The one who's afraid to fuck it up or the one that's excited to compete. And then sometimes there's someone in the middle that doesn't know what the hell they want, but they're not really competitors. But like you, you watch somebody warm up. They're either like really excited to fight. They're smiling. They got that like John Jones or is he out of look like let's like just happy to be there ready to fuck you up or they're probably super serious and or visibly scared like young athletes, right? Like like you see them got that like deer in the headlights look. They're afraid to fuck it up. So gratitude versus obligation. I have to win versus I'm excited that I get to compete. Completely different brain chemistry, so completely different body language, completely different ability to perform. Yeah, like you get to do this. I get to do this. Not other people. Not many other people get to feel those emotions and go through that. Yeah, and they don't. They don't have the emotional intelligence to understand that either. Hmm. Think about it. you dreamed your whole life to be in this position. Why would you, in the moments where you have doubts, listen to that bullshit story that your brain's trying to tell yourself? Why would you not be excited? Like you waited eight weeks, eight years for this opportunity. Why would I waste any bit of it with stress? But in that moment, you have to be strong enough to redirect it to the reasons you're excited, like why you're pumped to be here. Like where's the opportunity for me? Yep. Versus a lot of people focus on not fucking it up, which is an obligation, which is cortisol, which is adrenaline dumps, cognitive fatigue, lactic acid, all those things. I think like when I was undefeated, that's how I would fight. You know what I mean? Don't Try not to lose. Don't get my, don't lose my, oh. And it's like, once I lost it, it's like, fuck, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm curious with uh, Tony Ferguson, how he's going to do. Because if he's, come, he's coming off five losses, okay, I mean. I don't know if he's ever had a problem with being not mentally strong enough, but now he's training with the David Goggins guy. But it's also like five losses in a row. And, and you, in all five of those losses, you were prepared. You thought 100% you were going to win. You did everything you could, and then you failed. Then five times in a row that happened. So just dealing with that would just be fucking tough. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see. Is that just really a waste him doing that with David Goggins? Does he be does he need to be training with more technical people, or it's just hard to say? I think it's it's just his time. It's over, man. He's, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. I always tell myself if I if I got knocked out twice in a row, I'm done. done. You know what I mean? Like, you do lose that. He's older now, so 
So Tony got to, Tony finish. missed a lot of big opportunities. I see Tony's career going down similar when Johnny Hendricks lost the GSP. Like had had Tony maybe not gotten hurt that one time against Khabib when he was when he was supposed to fight and whatever else that other fight like had that gone different had Johnny Hendricks's win got that win over GSP been different. But I I noticed Tony got into like a lot of other things once he started getting successful. Businesses, his gym, like I feel like he got distracted, just like a lot of people do when they come into money. Mm-hmm. I feel like he got distracted and wasn't quite as focused. And he said that like in some of his posts that like I haven't been as present in my training type of thing, but it could have been drugs and alcohol too cuz I know yeah. I know he had like that DUI flipping a truck and then uh, he that enjoys time, his drugs. I think so. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I, th- I think his wife called the cops on him. He was talking about like people and stuff like oh he, he had tripping. like a psychotic break yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I i wish tony the best i don't know because he's fighting patty pimblet right i yeah. mean i feel like there's 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 ways he can win obviously i wouldn't be that surprised if tony won i just wouldn't be bro because patty is just it's not like patty's training with like really good competitive people you saw how he looked against jared gordon patty is good on the ground but he's not that great on the ground he's got a good left high kick but I think he's just good at getting on the back mm-hmm. and finishing it. Other than that, I, I don't think he has like a good Tony guard. needs a good game plan. That motherfucker's tough. He's the only one the last hell week with David Goggins. He doesn't need Goggins. I'm sure it makes him feel good. But like he needs a good game plan. That's it. He's got the skills. He just needs a good game plan and people that are going to hold him accountable, not yes man him, like we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. And like he gets a good game plan, he could beat anybody. He's still talented. I th- agree with you. He's past his prime, but... You know, he could win. Have you ever ran and had coaches in the past that were just too much of yes men that just won't tell you what you need to hear? Or you... No, not really, because I've only had, or, yeah, Eddie, Eddie Chaw is like a, a yes man. But will he? But sometimes he'll tell you what you need to hear, don't No, never. never. It, well, I think it's hard when you don't have a really close relationship with the person and you're coaching so many different people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and and majority of people just need that positive, positive reinforcement. But it's just, I guess, having that deep relationship with the person. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to, well, just like anyone in a position, right? You want them to come back unless they have, or you have a deep personal relationship with, and then you can tell them the hard things. Mm-hmm. It's not always, it's not always easy. Like I, we, we were talking earlier, they don't care what you know till they know that you care. So you can give hard advice if that person knows that you genuinely care. If you have a connection and a personal relationship outside of just being fighter coach. Yeah, but I think the thing with Eddie is he was more worried about money. You know what I mean? So that's why he he was a bigger yes man. Because yeah, you know when everything's going good, oh yes, yes, let's do this. Mm-hmm. But he he never kept it kept it one hundred. I never knew Eddie then, but I know Eddie now, and like I, I don't know, maybe that's changed over time. But I would imagine you know everyone everyone has different things. And but different he's he's, like he's a good he has a good mouthpiece, so he's a yeah. good kind man. Mm. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't mind Eddie. I don't mind yeah. coaching. Yeah, Eddie's now a, you guys had your differences. Yes, I, I, I have no issues with Eddie, but I, I'm sure there's people that speak about me the same way. So respect, I understand. Okay, here we go. De Niro money concern. Question for the Peoria Strangler Timbo: If I sent you me rizzing a random girl, would you review my work? A perspective <laughs> from the Rizzer, the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, the I, I, of I'd, Oz. I'd take a gander at it. I'd take a gander at it. That's what I was telling these guys. Uh, the Golden Bachelor. The Golden Bachelor, it's like 60 or 70 year olds now. Oh, yeah. And and they're trying to riz each other. And it's like, it's fucking funny, dude. It's good. <laughs> it's good. Oh, man. These women are good, especially these women that are, that they're like had a lot of plastic surgery and they've been, they've been little hustling women for a while. There is is good. I have they to watch it. Yeah, it's not bad. Okay. Tim and Dracar, what are three main things you would teach your, your guys first when building up a M? A new MMA program. I mean, everyone's different there, Kev. Everyone's got different backgrounds. But it's like you need to know how to. But there's just, two, just there's so many things in MMA. Learn the, the basics of everything. Yeah. Just the basics of every art, and then yep. and then you got to learn how to get up against a cage. You got to learn how to get up safely in your guard. You got to develop a guard. You got to be develop. How about you just get a blue belt at every martial art, like a, a blue belt. 
right? A yeah. blue belt in kickboxing, a blue belt in wrestling, a blue yeah. belt in jujitsu, a blue belt in MMA. That's a start, yeah. I don't understand. I mean, you guys are the experts here. I've just been around the game for a while and trained a lot of these people in wrestling and, and mindset. But like, why is it not a like a universal requirement? Like to become a professional, you are required this number of grappling matches, this number of kickboxing matches, maybe even a boxing match. Like, why is that not a thing? Just greasy co promoters. Promoters want to make money and promotions do make money. I mean, even a smaller show, you can freaking walk away with 30 grand, 40 grand cheddar. And it's like, you don't really care about whether the guys, I need a professional guy to fight this kid who's five and oh. I'm saying for the gym, gym rules. You oh, want to be a professional rules. fighter on my team, then you need a blue belt in jujitsu, a blue belt in wrestling. You need at least five grappling matches and won a tournament. You need at least three kickboxing matches with a winning record. Like something like that. Like, why is that not yeah, a thing? Yeah, it's not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. I mean, you have different guys who've, who've competed at a high level. I mean, Bryce Meredith, like someone like Bryce Meredith, he didn't even go amateur at all. And now I think yeah. he's 4 0 pro. Some people just ha know how to compete. But I, I like that. NCAA idea. national final is yeah. slightly different. For, no, for, for normal people, yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. You know, I wish like with some of the wrestlers that they like Bellator signed right out, they should at least did a couple developmental fights. Yeah, you know, just not. J jumping in right into the big show because now you know you get a couple wins you have to fight a top dog look at some of those really good wrestlers that that phased out of bellator uh ed ruth ed ruth yep he yeah. was a killer dude he was like a three-time national champion what's he doing now he's not even i don't even think he's coaching anymore compete i don't know if he's competing in jiu-jitsu i know he was a little bit he was he was smoking people at pan ams that was at blue belt <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> three-time national yeah. champion at blue belt yeah that's sweet okay here we go do you always put your shopping cart back after using it? You know what? I actually do most do of the time. Too, yeah. Most of the time. I'd say 90% of the time. You know 90. why? It's because Emily Whitmire would always post on her story people like, you yeah. pieces of shit. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'll just fucking put it. Dude, but it's like, like, it, it does give those kids something to do. Yeah. Always like, if someone leaves that, there's like, and I'll see him, I'll grab it and I'll, I'll push it back for him and look at him the whole time. Like, you <laughs> motherfucker. Shakar, yeah. did you wrestle? Like, like growing up? I did. Where at? I uh, wrestled at four different colleges. Where? I wrestled at Lindenwood University. You know, they dropped their program. Oh, did they? They literally this week just dropped their program. Okay. Sad, sad news. Sorry, continue. Uh, a JUCO out in Kansas. Uh, Which one? Neosho. Okay. I, I know exactly what that is. Uh, North Idaho College. I know exactly what that is. And then I wrestled at Great Falls University. In Montana. In Montana. I So I work with Providence. Okay. So I work with Providence and we have obviously mutual friends there, which by the way, Tim, I don't know if you saw, uh, they, uh, I got 150 pounds of elk in my fridge now. That's badass. Thanks. Well, well, I guess I can't really say I wrestled, you know, I just did like a little party tour. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. But, but you, you were a wrestler just by the way, the nature of you talking, like it seemed like you were a wrestler before. Yeah. Yeah. So you were, you're stacked up on your elk now, ground beef, just everything top everything, to bottom. Everything top. I have a seven draw fridge full of 150 pounds of a fresh elk cow. Oh, uh, how nice is Thanks that? Thanks to Comac. Yep. Was it his elk? Uh, I don't know if it was his elk, but it was like his tag. Damn. Yeah. That's badass. I'm, I feel uh, Joe Rogan would be very proud. I'm yeah. trying to have Dave kill a deer for me. Well, so Dave can, can kill a buffalo. <laughs> He'll, he, I mean, he could. Can, split can a you? Buffalo. I thought it's only on reservations. He's on the reservation. Yeah. yeah, bro. We need to talk after yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, Dave, hook it up. Come on, Dave. Give us some buffaloes. <laughs> buffalo's the best next to elk. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, here we go. This isn't. This is Lewis here from Patreon. This isn't sports related, but still psychology. Raising seven year old and five year old girls. What are, the, what are the crucial teachings we can give them to raise a good, strong woman? It's a great thing. Well, my 11-year-old is sitting outside right now. So um, I think to her, um, to raising a strong young woman, and I hope you guys chime in too, I think it's important for her to understand that like, she can do any... That, let me rephrase. And the most important thing you can teach anyone is the ability to think for themselves and like control, like understand that like your mind is stronger than your feelings, guy or girl. Girls need to have a very strong identity because they're the most easy manipulatable by like others, like good or bad, male or female. So like create a strong identity that she believes, like my daughter's very confident in herself. She's very outgoing. Um, she, I, I think, like I said, the, what was the first thing I said? Oh, uh, Mind stronger than your feelings, right? Because women are emotionally intelligent, but they're in their feels. 
So the biggest, easiest place where your daughter's going to go wrong is when her feelings make her decisions for her. So if you can do those things early in life, that's helpful. Lastly, what I would say, I make her do hard things. I make her sit in the sauna with me and I tell her it's 10 minutes, but I don't, at 20, she's like, how long was it? I'm like, oh, five more minutes. It's required. It's required. I make her choose to do hard things. I bring her to the point where she's like, previous years would be like ready to quit or say, uh, say I can't do it. And it shows her that like she's got more left in the tank. And I feel like that's my job. Like I, I don't, I don't live in the same state as her anymore. So when I see her, I want to like make the most impact that I can. So I try to do things like that where we do things that I know that are hard. She's going to hit a breaking point. I'm going to be patient, but she's going to understand that like that wasn't all she had left. So I think that's really important for a woman. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a daughter, I have a son, but like like you said, I think that's really like Courtney, I think she was raised like that. Like they made her do things and re like respect herself cuz like like she's very independent. Like she doesn't need a man. And uh and that's what I love about her. Yeah. What age do you guys start like punishing your kids? I mean, cuz I'm with I uh, hang out with Sean and his 3-year-old daughter and she runs the joint. <laughs> hmm, <no. laughs> Sean, like, Sean, Sean, I can see that. And uh, so, what age did you like start putting them in timeout, or what did you do when they're just back talking and disrespecting you? I never had that. I was really fortunate. But if they like do something wrong, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know when you started with yours, but like, as long as they were able to emote, like, uh, what's the word? Like, just communicate effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, like otherwise, like in the first year and a half, you're just talking to a human dog. You know what I mean? Like bad, not good. Don't do that. Like they understand, but when they can communicate, as soon as they can communicate, then, you know, it's beyond just the verbal cues. I don't know what you think. Um, you know, like with Kingston, I told him like, oh, at when he gets five, you know, he should be able to understand. But fuck, it's so hard to discipline him because he just makes me laugh. Like, I don't know. He just like. <laughs> yeah. You got to remember these yeah. kids don't know what they don't know. They're like three to five years old. Like we expect them to make the right decisions, but they don't even know what the hell the right decisions are. Mm -hmm. If they make the wrong decisions, I feel like this is what Jocko says. Jocko says poor performance requires more leadership, not punishment. So if you have consistently poor performance, then it leads to punishment, usually removal or like change of job, whatever. Right. But like they're young. They don't know, like coach them. If they maliciously do dumb shit or mean shit or bad shit, then sure, punish them the same way your dog would piss on the carpet. Like, don't do that. Do this. But we need to coach our kids when they're younger. And then, like he said, when you know the difference of right or wrong and you make, you make, you know, the wrong decisions, I think parents also go on punishment. What they should go on more is disappointment. Think of what hurts more. Getting grounded for two weeks or like, I'm really disappointed in what you did. Yep. Like, that hurts. Was it when you got separated from your wife and you got sp started to split custody and stuff of the kids, mm -hmm. was it almost like better? Because some, some, some uh, couples, like I said, that just stay together just because they think it's better for the kid, but they're treating each other like shit. They don't want to be good parents. Mm -hmm. They're just fucking. But then they separate and then they want to make that time meaningful with their kids. You think it's better in some ways? I think there's pros and cons to both. There's pros and cons to... Two, two people in a healthy parenting relationship parenting a kid, well, there's not really any cons, but there's there's pros to that. There's pros and cons to, you know, un, you know parents staying together, even though they're not happy, pros and cons. And there's also pros and cons to being apart. Like, we don't get to be with each other all the time, but, like, the quality of the time, like, the, the, the appreciation of the time is much more versus when I lived down the road, you know, like... I was busy, she was busy, so like I would see her for a day or two at a time. Now I make sure I see her for like a week at a time. Yeah. We do stuff. All I would say, it just kind of sucks like when uh, he goes to his mom's because like uh, we got a set of rules. And then when he goes over there, different he has a different set of rules. So it's like each time he has to come back and forth and you know what I mean? I, I can tell tough. he picks up ba bad habits over there and mm -hmm. vice versa, you know what I mean? And it's like, fuck, we never get him on the straight. Straight and narrow. I bet that's a little bit tough. Yeah. I think we co-parent well. I think like they're good over there. I'm good over here. I think we both add different values. It's almost like she gets, like, you know, when you get multiple families, you get multiple Christmases, right? Yeah. Like I'm not talking about the multiple Christmases, but like we get multiple good approaches. Instead of just two people's approach, we essentially get three people's approach. And I think ultimately like that's why she's a gangster. Yeah. I think my, my son knows that. So he plays that game. Mm. He's like, oh, I'm, like when I, like, hey, just to try to discipline him. I want to go to mom's. 
What? You know what I mean? <laughs> Fuck your mom, no shucks. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, Gabe says, for the psychologist, what's the biggest obstacle? Mindset, Mike here. What's the biggest obstacle you've faced helping an athlete struggling? It's a very broad question. Like, what's what's the biggest thing you've helped an athlete just kind of get over? Or, like, have you seen someone who just legit didn't want to compete and you got them to compete and they won or something? I think I've got, like, all the things. You know, people that were absolutely down in the gutter. Let's take Linton Vassell and Bellator. He was 0-3. Then we went on a 5-0 and title run. We're supposed to be... He was... Bellator was trying to get him cut. Like, they felt... They, they, they fed him number one contenders. He knocked them out. Like, he was in a bad place. And then he was supposed to fight Bader for the title in San Diego. Got COVID. That was a big turnaround. I think Wei Li. Wei Li was in a really tough place when I got to her after Rose. She lost her love for fighting. Sure, why was no longer strong. Um, she was not happy. Uh, that was a pretty big turnaround. And then just the, the very typical people that were like super nervous, could never show their best, and then winning a world championship with a plus 600 underdog, you know, having stuff like that. Like there's, I, I live in that realm. So those are two examples. Um, I've had 18 people beat number one in the country of the world. So those are people where it's 19 now. So those are people who had the deck stacked against them. Like those, that's my favorite statistic, like 19 major upsets that weren't supposed to happen. So the worst problems, everyone's got their own. Like what's mm. worse for you is not worse for him, but they're problems for you and they're problems for him. Nice. Okay. This one's NZM Charlie here. How would a young Mike Tyson have gone in the octagon with a bit of grappling under his belt? Ooh. Um, psh, I mean, he'd be scary as fuck. I think you'd do good. I yeah. think you'd do good too. Yeah. It's explosive as fuck. Just mean. Yeah, he'd do good. Four ounce gloves, Jesus. He'd probably take someone's head off their body. Yeah. Ugh. I'd probably say he had to cut down maybe eighty five. Yeah, one eighty five er. Yeah. He wh who was that guy that was? How tall loaded? was he? Five eleven or shorter? Five, I don't 10, know. Five eleven, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Who was that guy that got Tyson. caught with steroids years ago? Was it Shane Carwin, the short, stocky guy? Big fists. Yeah. Yeah. He 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 would be like he would be like a Shane Carwin. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for real. A two by four. Okay, Connor says here, how do you make it to the UFC? What would you say, Dre? Shit, hard work. And, dude, like, you, we, you, we know the recipe or the, the recipe. secret. You know yeah. what I mean? It's a, uh, you got to stay, stay on, on, along on the journey. Yeah. It might take a long time, but if you just stay, keep doing it, you're going to make it. Yeah, years and years of just, I mean, not just like, I got to get to the UFC to be, it was years, years of joy in the fucking process, dude. The process, whatever whatever process your coaches come up with, and that's the process they've given you. Just try to enjoy it and fucking do it for yeah, years. Yeah, because all the all the guys that have have made it, we've all known each other for eight eight years plus. You know what I mean? Like always having a good time in practice, yeah. no matter what. People don't look at that. They don't remember that like Conor McGregor lived in his car. They don't remember that you started fighting how many years ago. <sighs> 11, 12. Yeah, like people think that like you get good at fighting a couple years, get a couple fights, and boom, you're in the UFC. Like you motherfuckers have been at this for the better part of a decade. And then I would count also the years that you wrestled. Yep. That's training. Yep. You know, you wouldn't have made it there without that. Like people don't think of that. Like this is not easy. It's That's not why a, I think it's hard for people just to try to jump into it when they have no background. Yeah. You know, like you're going to have to at least put five to six years in before you even know anything literally stuck until you're just and then you're still scratching the surface five six years and you're maybe a purple belt if you've went every i mean four times a week <laughs> yeah. so it's crazy all right guys uh where can everyone follow you on instagram mike mindset underscore mike or just type in mindset mike that's the easiest place to find me and then what's yours again dracar uh dracar close aka power bomb <laughs> <laughs> power bottle oh, i mean bomb <laughs> <laughs> so all right ladies and gentlemen hope you enjoyed the pod uh like and subscribe and comment your thoughts below and i'll see you guys next week love y'all bye-bye